So the next, the next section is admittedly experimental. I haven't really tried to do this in a workshop before. Um, but it is the time we've heard a lot of great ideas, very expansive. Um, but now we, we have to try to start making sense of it. And by we, I mean we, we program folk at NHGRI. And um, I want to bring you into our world a little bit. We, these are, this, these set of discussions is designed to bring out some of the issues that I'm anticipating will come up as we internally discuss how to follow up from this workshop, how to take it and take the results and the, the, the recommendations and make them into programs. So at the beginning of the workshop, I demapped our programs from the topics, and now we have topics with some changes and, and nuance and, and recommendations. We're going to try to remap them. But we're not asking you to con here to converge on, on uh, specific programs. I'm trying here to tease out some important elements of programs, some decision points um, for each of the main topics that we've discussed today. And to try to get some pros and cons, because as I said at the beginning, the pros and cons are, are many instances more useful to us than the you should do it this way kind of recommendations. Because at the end of the day, we're going to hear lots of conflicting stuff about you should do it this way versus this way, or if you go this way, then you won't be able to do this. With the rationales, then we can try to plot a path of what we need to encourage and what we should try to avoid. And that's going to ultimately be more helpful. And again, I don't know what's going to work, if it's going to work. So, here, here is the idealized scheme for this. Um, you sort of start with roughly, for each of these topics, roughly what would be the right organization. Um, you could start with the current organization as a default. You can start with a generality based on what you heard earlier this morning. And then list a set of topics or features that could be alternatives. So centralized versus dispersed, or as Bill brought up, siloed versus uh, versus unified. And th there actually are reasons we silo things, right? Organizationally, sometimes we have to do that. Um, but then maybe, and, and again, these things, are, these things are, maybe a lot of them are false dichotomies, as was raised a number of times during this. But it's the features that we want to keep from each of those uh, that we should, um, we should focus on here. Um, and I'm going to do the first one with Len, so maybe you get a better idea. They won't be exactly the same uh, for each of these, for each of the major headings. Um, uh, and um, at the end of this, we'll try to wrap it up. Um, um, Rex and I will be up here trying to wrap up across all the different topics. And by the end of that discussion, I hope we have a good feeling of what people want and don't want to see in programs, and more importantly, why. And again, I hope the first example that, that Len and I will go through will give people enough, uh, enough information to suggest um, some of these uh, instead of us just coming up with them on the fly. Because these are coming up on the fly. I haven't given my colleagues uh, any more briefing than I just gave you. So Len, do you want to come on up? Or would you rather circulate in the audience? And and if I could ask um, if I could ask Lou to keep to keep time and uh, let us know when it's time to wrap up after about twenty minutes or something like that. So, Ella, yep. Yeah. Yeah, for the whole for the whole thing. Um, how much the time did I give on the agenda? How much time did I give on the agenda for for each of for each element? Half hour. So, let me know it after about twenty minutes of discussion. All right. So so element one is the is the general architecture of disease topic. It is, has to encompass uh, common and Mendelian and all the other things that were talked about. And I think what we heard this morning, vastly oversimplifying it from the breakout run report, was there's still a need for discovery at scale. We're just figuring out how to do this. Keep going with paradigmatic examples. So that's that's a, the two-sentence summary, three-sentence summary. 
And here are some, I'll just launch right into the topics. Um, you said, Eric, that we need to consider everything across the spectrum, um, but I heard David Altshuler say last night uh, that, uh, that the current organization we have, we actually have a current organization, we have big centers for common disease and other stuff, and then we have very pretty focused Mendelian centers. And I heard David say, well, don't do it that way because it doesn't go with the way the science is going. And on the other side, on the other side, I'm worried, I'm very worried that if there isn't some way to focus on them, some organizational way to focus on the Mendelians, uh, that we'll, we'll actually lose focus on those. So I'd like to hear some, so that's, that's one potential pro and con, and I'm going to ask David to, to start off with why, why did you make that remark and how would you suggest addressing it? Well, the main point, the uh, only comment I want to make about what you said is I wasn't making an organizational point as much as a scientific point. So I wasn't necessarily saying what, what the form should be of grants or centers not specializing as much as making the point that scientifically, in terms of integrating data, in terms of having it, uh, the thought process, we don't want to make a fetish out of you know what the prior assumption was about the architecture. Um, so I, I've, I haven't been deeply involved enough in the Mendelian centers or there might be groups of particular expertise who choose to focus on that and that might be a very good thing as long as we don't end up promoting that they should be held separate, as long as we don't silo the data, as long as we don't make arguments uh, on the assumption that they're different as opposed to letting the data drive it. So I don't mean to undermine your provocative statement, but... No, it's okay. That's right, Bob. I, just to follow up on that, it seems to me that the, for the Mendelian in particular, that involves a set of particular, I don't know, expertise and links uh, reaching out to the community and so forth. And so to pile that in with everything else might be a mistake. You need, you need some of that particular expertise. Yeah, I also want to s support that. Um, I was maybe dubious about the idea of creating large-scale centers, Mendelian centers, clinical projects, when that first started. I've come to think this is a really good idea. The, the thing that supports, uh, the thing that NHGRI does very well is it invests in creating the infrastructure that's really excellent around the problem. And sometimes that's the infrastructure about large-scale data production or analytical design or, or project design or analysis. Seeing the Mendelian centers really focus on a problem, it's very clear that's a different problem in certain respects in the technical, under the hood respects about how to manage that. I agree with David Altra, there's got to be a lot of free flow of data, there are going to be Mendelian things cropping up in common and, 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 and the Mendelians will be focusing on common traits in, in overlapping ways, but actually developing deep excellence is the one thing that doesn't get done either in the commercial center, sector or gets done in lots of little grants. Critical mass has benefits, and I think we're seeing it in the Mendelian centers, we're seeing it in the clinical, and so I think what distinguishes NHGRI is, is the ability to get critical mass and excellence at things that most other people, most other institutes, most other companies kind of ignore as requiring of excellence. So I kind of think that, that that's actually an important element. Yeah, Evan. I mean, I guess one comment regarding this Mendelian versus common, I would, I would suggest or I'd like to argue that maybe the definition of Mendelian should be expanded a little bit. I mean, there's a lot of success being achieved in things like autism. And autism doesn't necessarily fit nicely into one of these bins in terms of Mendelian or common. And I, you know, we've talked to people that run Mendelian centers, and they have a lot, a lot very strict rules in terms of what types of families can be put into them. And I think there's a lot of bang for the buck that could be leveraged if focused efforts in specific diseases where rare variants as well as common variants are playing an important role. I was curious, is there need for better integration between the common architecture and Mendelian? Or right now it's pretty siloed, so is there? Yes. I, I think integration would be a really good thing and there is this overlap around things, but, but just munging the distinction wouldn't be a good thing. So, 
so one one way to follow up on Eric's comment, and, and Bob and I were just talking here, is I think the essence of Eric's comment, which I, I do agree with, is specialization, expertise, critical mass, form following function are very good things. Whether NHGRI should dictate that the one such split, and I'm not saying it was the wrong decision in the past, is Mendelian, not Mendelian. It could be there are other form, there's some groups, you know, the kind of stuff Evan and Jim and uh, you know, uh, talk about so passionately about structural variants. Maybe there's some specialized thing around genome assembly and structural variants. It doesn't matter whether it's a common or rare disease. Or there could be multiple types of specialization. So the idea that you want to integrate and not silo or predetermine that specialization doesn't mean everybody should be a generalist. Yeah. Um, without okay. commenting on the specific organizational structure, I want to say that over the last three or four years, one of the most satisfying and productive things I've witnessed is the contact between genomics expertise and the clinical expertise. And bridging the full span there has, has uh, been enormously productive. So my hope is that whatever the organizational structure is, that that is a central focus. Thanks. I, I, I want to add to that, which is, um, or comment on that, which is that's actually the, the area within the current program that seems to be, seems to have the most separate needs um, and administratively tends to be more and more separate. And I'm, 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 I always worry about how to, how to get the best cross-fertilization. Um, so if you, if people have ideas, yeah. So just to comment <clears throat> specifically on that, I think, you know, one of the goals in the current iteration uh, was to try to get more disseminated activity around the country in hopes that uh, that would nucleate uh, ac uh, additional activities. In our case, uh, certainly the Mendelian Center has catalyzed clinical uh, sequencing. We did 500 clinical cases uh, last year based on the scale that was achieved through the Mendelian Center without NHGRI putting in any additional funds for development of the clinical work. That's the kind of leveraging that I think you can achieve by getting some level of uh, dissemination of high quality work being done. Yes, Ewan. I mean, I'm just wondering whether you, you shouldn't let this be a bottom up process with some, some framework for how, for the criteria, but you just let people try and choose the area, the kind of scope that they want to fit into, um, and then have, think more about the criteria about how to judge and rank them. Uh, I think there's something incredibly, I mean, everybody's commented on this, but there's something incredibly artificial about trying to draw the boundary lines here. And, and I just feel that investigators will know better where they want to draw the boundary lines, and it will fit, fit better to their local context. Yeah. Um, I know that puts, that kind of punts this problem onto the review committee, but at least a review committee there will see concrete proposals in front of them. So, so, so yeah, so yeah, that's. I, so, I think yeah. we've been singularly challenged by the idea of sending vague things to review committees. Um, I, I like, you know, the, in theory, I like it. In practice, for example, we've sent up centers without any work plans. We've been unclear whether the center is responsible for coming up with the work plan or whether it's going to be given a work plan. Um, I, th I think actually the heart of this is if we're looking for centers that are defining the work plan, saying we're coming with these ideas, these samples, whatever, that's one thing. If we're saying they're a central resource and NHGRI is defining the projects and allocating them, some of, the, some of that is coming up along here on some of the questions, that, that's another. But I think punting everything to rev a review committee that meets for an afternoon um, and isn't deeply invested in constructing a program that hasn't even spent as much time as, as we've spent in two days has its problems also. So it might be a good thing for NHGRI. Now, that's not to say it's got to fit in fixed boxes. Those boxes can be more flexible. But I, I, I think leaving all degrees of freedom to the randomness of a review committee don't, has challenges too. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that. Um, and I think uh, this is the art of crafting good RFAs and yeah. doing this right. Uh, which bits do you constrain and which bits do you yeah. leave, leave open? And uh, the thing that I think is a mistake to constrain here is these, this place in this spectrum between Mendelian through to common. It, just from the conversation, it seems like that's a mistake. Now, I'm, I might be wrong. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm, I've got 
uh, incredible insight into this thing. But from the conversation so far, that seems to be like a, a place where the investigators understand better than, the, than trying to set it out uh, ahead of yeah, time. But of course, a, a challenge then is you toss it to a review committee, and the review committee likes all grants of type B, and doesn't like the grants of type A, and NHGRI doesn't end up with, say, Mendelians covered. So there is some art to figuring out how you get the portfolio you'd like to get yeah, out also. I, I think that can be constructed in my understanding good, good. of make, making sure uh, We're that just the putting the design criteria out The there. portfolio is rounded. I mean, that's, that's the criteria is that you have a rounded portfolio. It's good. Fair enough. Right. And that, I think that leads naturally, as Eric said, to this project selection question which I have to say is, is an area that I don't think we've got uh, completely right. Uh, I don't think, I'm, I worry about, um, uh, I worry about how to, how to bring the community more into some of these decisions about doing this. I, I worry about uh, fairness and rigor uh, and review issues. All these comments are comments that have been brought to my attention. So I just, I just put this as a, a sort of, three kinds of elements. There's investigator initiated versus NHGRI initiated versus community initiated. How do we, how do we balance that? What's the, what's the right thing to do? Or even those of you who are familiar with the current way we bring things on, where have your bit, where have your, especially outside the centers, where have been, where have you noticed things that you didn't think were right? And, and uh, what would you, what kind of things would you consider to, to do them better? Yeah, David. Well, one thing that I think was, has been very productive, just to share the example in type 2 diabetes, that, that I think is a good model, we talked in Eric Green's, Eric Green talked about, you know, funding partnerships, is NHGR, NIDDK started a type 2 diabetes genetics initiative and put up money, but in the end, then there was a partnership with NHGRI, and actually not only, and at two different centers, if I understand correctly, different work went on. In fact, some of the work was outsourced to complete genomics, um, but it ended up being that coming together, uh, there was a project that had funding from multiple sources and was a better project, and now there's also a, lar a lot of energy that's gone into um, aggregating the data and making it useful, and now pharma has come in through the Accelerated Medicines Partnership. That's an example where NHGRI's funding was leveraged, but clearly played a catalytic role at important moments. Um, I'd like personally to see not that NHGRI do this alone, which is a failure, I think will be a failure, nor that all the institutes go off and do it and companies go off and do it in a siloed way, but somehow that kind of model where there's also diversity of designs and mm -hmm. many people looking at the data, um, as opposed to monolithic. Uh, co sort of coordinated, or not even coordinated, but there's this idea that I learned about, um, David Hausler taught me this, this phrase, uh, you know, uh, uh, define the interface, compete on implementation, which is a sort of a software thing. What we want to do is make sure we have multiple people contributing data and resources, but we make sure it will come together in some way, you know, or be useful in some way together as opposed to being siloed. And I think the trick of that is, is, uh, is something that Andrew has done well, maybe in, maybe in cancer, maybe in diabetes, maybe there's four or five others I don't know about, but this should be modeled. Dave. Uh, what's the rough breakdown right now in these categories in terms of projects funded by NHGRI? Yeah, I, I would say that, um, about, well, between 70, I don't know exactly. I would have to guess between 70 and 90% of the funds are actually going to big projects that are partnerships of the kind that, that David just mentioned over the last four years. That includes um, TCGA and more recently ADSP, um, type 2D genes, um, and a couple of others. Um, yeah, you win. So I, I appreciate the, the headache and the problem here. And just to, be, just to make sure, you know, there's a lot of practicalities of sample flow, sample quality, consents. If you add recall as being a desirable thing as well, that complicates it even more. And therefore, the practical business of finding, and, and then if you want to add in this scale, that it's got to be done at, at high scale, I think you probably come down to quite a small list already. I may be wrong. And I think the experience has been again and again that the, the system that's going to consume those samples need to have a very good engagement process with the system that has those samples. And it has to be a two-way process. And these, you know, one can't, you know, dictate kind of 
force managers in this. It's not a, yeah. it's not a productive process. So that, I think, leads to the idea that there has to be quite a managed process that involves the investigators that are working at scale that work with the, 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 um, the people who have the samples. And one has to um, probably give those investigators who work at scale quite a lot of freedom to make sure that they will deliver on that, whilst also holding their feet to the fire to, to deliver on that scale. But I think this is a very, very complicated area to, to execute. And, I, I, and there's quite a lot of experience about how to handle this. So I think I, I would be interested in other people's views about this, because I just don't think this is an easy thing to get balance on compared to, say, those model organism white papers, which were, you know, once you decided scientifically that this was a good thing to do, you just had to find one person with one animal that sometimes a few animals. It was a, it was a completely different problem um, in that era to this, uh, this sample scale-out era. Um, uh, so I, I really think we should explore this because this is going to be a big problem at working at scale, keeping the communities alongside, keeping the other ICs involved, but also delivering on it. I mean, that, that matrix is what, it feels like one of those things has got to go. You know, you'd like all of them, but I, I feel like one of them's got to go. Eric? But, but I, I guess I'm, maybe I'm naive, but I think it's, it's a place that we've done well the last several years of integrating ourselves very well into these disease-oriented communities. It's no longer, it's the clinical community and the sequencing community. And, you know, we send emails back and forth. You know, in the case of diabetes that was already mentioned, heart disease, the Mendelian centers, I think the genomics community is very much integrated inside that biomedical slash clinical domain. And, and I think if we're going to achieve the goals that Ewan talked about, we need to continue that, it is, is to make, at the end, in order to make sure that the large numbers of appropriately consented high quality samples are available and that information will be made available large, you know, in, in a very broad context, I think having that complete integration and not just keeping the community along or that community alongside, but actually that full integration, I think, is the way to go. And I think we've, we're, we're achieving that one step at a time. Lou, Lou how much time do I have left? Okay, we've got time. <laughs> Um, no, I, I just didn't, I didn't know. Okay. All right, I want to spend a little bit of time on the last, the last two because they, they've come up directly and this is almost a prioritization or a timing or a staging. Um, and we heard both about the merits of, of discovery, um, sort of bottom up, and we heard about the virtuous cycle and, and the, data, the miracle database that's gonna capture all the variant information from all the clinical efforts all over the world and feed into discovery. What, what's the, we're gonna have to make some choices. We don't have infinite resources. We, even though we may, have, uh, we may have really great partners in this, what, what's kind of the right allocation? Is there any way to talk about the right allocation, or is it only, can we only say, yes, we have to do both of these? Is there some way to get a better, a better refinement on, on, on where and sort of staging how we need to invest more, and in, especially in the, the second one of these? Because I'm, I'm, well, if we, if we have a finite amount of funds and we can invest it in, in the discovery, in the mode that we've been doing now, or we can invest it in trying to recapture uh, clinical data so that we can get an, enough to make discoveries or have a resource for discovery 10 years from now, how, how, do we, how do we decide between those, or should we decide between those? I, I think the, the point was made well before that we shouldn't be paying for clinical service. And the act of integrating into clinical practice and, and completing the virtuous cycle and having prepaid research subjects um, is really what we're trying to achieve. So maybe it's not such a, a, a dichotomous choice and that the, the integration into the clinical activity is not going to drain the budget. Okay. I think if we don't make discoveries, 
we're going to lose the support of the public and the rest of the NIH community. If we make discoveries, now, the past year there's been a number of interesting discoveries of loss of function variants that are protective and the drug companies are all excited and they're on them. If there's a steady flow of discoveries, the rest will follow, including funding and other people following us. If we say, sit tight, we're going to assemble resources that over time will let us discover, the argument I fear will wear thin. So that doesn't say the portfolio involves none of that, but I think, I think we better deliver on discoveries. And if the next three or four or five years have a lot of the architecture and, and pathways of common diseases and hundreds of more Mendelian diseases coming out, we'll be fine. And then the whole clinical world that's doing sequencing will help shape that and that will drive the generation after. But we're going to be held, as I think we've been held in every, every period of, of, of genomic work, to having fruitful products in the here and now. Howard. So I, so I think there's a, I think they're not split. Um, so I think we still need for discovery, we have to have large scale. If we're going to be looking at these disease issues, we're going to need to have large scale activities still in place. That's for sure. I mean, the, just the sample sizes alone are going to re require some large scale activities. But if we're going to grow the clinical side, as was discussed before, I think there's a limited number of things that really have to be done um, to help drive value into this. As value is driven more into it, other people are going to pay for this. The hospital systems, the insurers are going to pay around that. So what we have to do is build the base that helps that happen, but not at the expense of discovery. I, I think if we go away from discovery, we're in trouble, but if we completely ignore and hope somebody else is going to figure out how to do this clinically, we will also slow down the process of developing large sample sets in the clinical environment. So I think CSER and these other programs are at the beginning, but I think what the clinical group was talking about, although I, I share Eric's concern, our job isn't to implement across the board, but I think we are in a position to help establish baselines of how you do it, uh, and then that enables others to then get on board in the clinical arena. Yes. Yeah, uh, along the lines of public support, I think a relatively small investment in education and in uh, making the public aware of such discoveries, which I agree do need to happen, might go a long ways for sustainability and for further investment. So I, I, I just don't see that in, in the bullets there, but I think mm -hmm. it's an important portion. Yeah, and, and there the, the contrast would be um, with, with building, the, building the foundational part, the community resource part, versus making the discoveries. I think that's another kind of balance we've got to strike, so, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, 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 back to Eric's point. Uh, I can see over the next few years uh, discovery is going to be still uh, a fairly narrow channel, and the NHGRI can have a, a leading role in figuring out how to make those discoveries. But in a few years, I, I would suspect that there's going to be a torrent of sequence uh, coming from a variety of places, and hopefully, and, and the NH, just because of the budget of the NHGRI, uh, they're not going to be a major driver anymore. Uh, and, and one way to continue to be a major driver in that is this integration of the data. Uh, because all of these sources are not going to talk to one another well. Uh, and NHGRI can play a major role in, in making sure that that happens and make it a much more powerful uh, resource for everybody. And, and lead in the discovery in that sense. Okay. Jim. So, I, you know, NHGRI has, to its credit, and I think to a lot of um, productivity, been a fairly top-down center, right, um, or institute. And I, I think that, 
you know, harnessing the community maybe by shifting that just a little bit will take some of the, the difficulty of making these top-down decisions, which are at some level kind of impossible. Um, and, and, you know, perhaps some consideration to, to increased um, grantees, right, increased uh, uh, individual investigator type um, driven projects, not in an extreme sense, because again, NHGRI has been very successful with the top down approach, but that might allow harnessing, you know, things are mature enough in many ways where one could imagine um, effectively, uh, effectively, again, harnessing that, that uh, thinking of the community in ways that we haven't been able to as well. I, I just want to echo Bob's point because if, if you just think a little bit about the projections that Illumina has for the number of sequencers they expect to sell and, you know, it, it's somewhere on the order of, you know, dozens next year, you know, in the mid-dozens, maybe 40, 50, 60 of the X10s, right? And, and you just sort of put that into context with what capacity we already have, right? It, it's clear that NIH is going to get dwarfed in terms of sequencing capacity if it isn't already, right? And so that, that aspect of figuring out how to get, you know, the people who've bought those machines to share the data uh, is actually probably the single most important thing that, you know, and, and where the Global Alliance and others can come in. I, I think the key thing here, and I think, mm -hmm. I know that Eric and, 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 uh, and others are thinking this way and, B, and Phil Bourne at BDUK, but we just have to be careful. This room is an NHGRI meeting, and it might be attractive to imagine NHGRI can dictate this answer. But certainly, every discussion I've been in makes clear that, uh, as I, I said this in the uh, other uh, in our breakout group, I'll say it again here. In the international discussions and sort of discussions with different stakeholders, clinical companies, et cetera, one group that they clearly they're not sure who should do this, but the one group they're clear should not do it is the United States government. Okay, and so we just have to realize that like a top-down imposed, and, it, and I think the one of the things you hear in these discussions is many parties will say, yeah, yeah, we're setting the standard, and others will use it. And I think the only way to actually do this, and there are models from other fields, and that's what the Global Alliance is modeling itself on the World Wide Web Consortium, which has been highly successful is, and I sort of threw this in out of context, that was wrong time to say it, but focus on the interface. You know what I'm saying? Don't try and determine the outcome. Don't tell everyone what data they should collect or how are they going to store it or implement it. This is where you get the mistake as you try and build the big database in the sky or tell everyone what technology to use. Figure out how the data will flow. Get the data flowing. And we do have to think about, you know, there, there are technical aspects of that. There are regulatory aspects of that. And there are incentive issues. And I think that when Eric Lander pointed out, you know, earlier, we don't know what the business models are. I do think that that not that NHGRI are going to set them, but everyone in this room or people in this room are all leaders. Like, if there's no incentive, the reason things happen often in the world and certainly in medicine is because someone reimburses them or somebody profits from them. And we can be very idealistic and say the data should flow because flow is good. Maybe we need to create a social pressure to do that. That's another incentive. But we can't be naive that if we, you know, right. we just have to build the pipes and we have to think about why will people actually send things through them because otherwise they'll sit idle. Right. And, and, and the reason people share. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mark, Mark, <laughs> Mark. I, I, I. Yeah. I think we, we've, David. You made that point strongly, and I think a couple of others have. We've. Yeah, it's a good point. Mark. I just want to amplify what uh, Bob and Carlos were saying, and that I, I really do think that with so much sequencing in the future, you know, NHGRI really needs to think about things beyond sequencing and things that are going to enable the use of all that genomic sequencing better, you know, sort of foundational resources that, you know, can make all the genomic sequencing quite useful, whether it's, you know, characterizing all the variants or interpreting them. So, so I want to ask in the, in the last 30 seconds a specific question about especially coming from this point of view, this, this first breakout's point of view, the bottom up, balance of bottom up versus top down um, um, sort of functional analysis. And um, for example, if you had a program much like the current program now and you wanted it to start exploring functional validation, uh, how, how, much would you, how much would you let them do? Uh, or large centers do, I'm not sp talking about any specific people, but in a large center, how useful is, would it be to 
team it with some kind of downstream functional validation exercise. And is that, is that too much or is it an amount that's, that's just right? Something, I'm ask, I, I hope you have a feel for the question. So Adam, yeah. so w one idea there might be that there, there are some assays that have been developed already a few years ago and that could now be done at scale, for example, for many promoters or many transcription factors, some of the things that Jay illustrated. But I think in parallel, you do want diversity. So you want people to be developing the next round of assays. And maybe the balance is that, you know, trying to figure out what are assays that you can do at scale for, you know, for hundreds of KB or megabases of sequence. And what, are ass what are new assays that you want to develop to add that portfolio over time? Is that I, from the perspective of uh, the Mendelian centers, this has been a key issue because so many of uh, our collaborators, we make uh, the discovery from the genomic work and they of course then want to uh, pers uh, prosecute the functional validation and the pursuit uh, of that. That's quite a complicated interface for NHGRI to be intimately involved in. And it's anti-leveraging, right? You don't know uh, at the outset uh, what the assays are going to be uh, and how you're go what's going to be necessary to solve them. It seems like a very good interface for some kind of partnership with the specific institutes that are the domains in which the discoveries are made. But you would like to have a more rapid uh, turnaround with the other institutes where you say, we've got this new discovery of, uh, you know, and we can name 268 uh, genes pro following uh, the discussion yesterday, uh, where we now know that uh, this gene is implicated in this disease uh, and we would like to do the next steps. How to manage that interface, I think, is a key uh, consideration. But I think it would be very complicated for NHGRI to be in the middle of actually trying to fund each of those. Thanks. I think that's, I, I want to wrap it up there because. I, I, can I just quick, quick sure. comment on, on to that? I mean, I think given the diversity of genes uh, and you don't know ahead of time what you're going to get, it's just impossible to know where the boundary is going to be and how much it's going to cost. It's a, it's a decision that has to be made when you find it. So this is a good uh, time to turn it over to the two.